Today we have assembled after maybe two and a half years. The, instead of virtual, the physical speaker and chairperson is there. Um, respected uh, member secretary Satyananda who is not present but who is the inspiration of all our program and our very dynamic and enthusiastic director Professor Anirban Dasji and our today's speaker is Professor Shobha Das from Professor Urbuti Studies in Kutan University Kyoto and today our chairperson is Professor Shoshi Balaji uh, and amongst us, another very well-known scholar, Professor Udayanath Shah, who was at the University, and all our national manuscript to, to my colleagues. Uh, national Mission for Manuscripts, everybody knows that it is from 2003. We are doing a lot of job in different, in, uh, in locating the manuscripts all over the country, because India has a rich heritage of manuscript heritage, full of knowledge and then location, then digitization, documentation, digitization and dissemination of knowledge. Apart from that, Urbation organizes outreach program, whether in uh, workshop form or the seminar forms or Tattavada lectures form. And today, it's a Tattavada lecture. Every month, mission organizes a Tattavada lecture. Last two, two and a half years, we are doing the virtual form, speaker and chairperson will be virtual. And today, after two and a half years, we are having the physical presence of everybody. I would invite our director, Professor Das, to welcome our speaker, and uh, Professor Shwakadani Das, and our chairperson, Professor Shashivaraji. Buddhism. 
And now I'll talk about the chairperson, Professor Shashivala, because all of us are eager to listen to the speaker and then to chairperson. Uh, Professor Shashivala ji, everyone knows her as uh, Professor Das is that main Buddhism epitome of in Japan and Professor Shashivala in India. And she's a renowned Indologist and Dean of Kane Munsi Center of Indology at Bharti Vita Bhavan. She is recipient of the highest civilian state award of Mongolia and author of more than 25 books and 100 articles. She specializes in India's cultural contributions to the world. Recently, she edited the English Sanskrit Dictionary made by Acharya Raghavira before 1947, but she edited and make it contemporary and um, what to say every week how many lectures she delivers on Buddhism and ideology related everybody knows that and I would like to um, invite our speaker today Professor Shashivana Das to start with Shashivana Das sorry Shashivana Das extremely sorry Shashivana and we are very eager to listen to you you can take 40 minutes, 3.45. Thank you. So, uh, Namaste everybody. And uh, thank you for your uh, speaker. And uh, thank you so much for uh, coming to listening. Uh, I don't know uh, whether that is up to your expectation or not. But uh, it will be just sharing some information. And uh, I'm very thankful to uh, uh, Director Anima, uh, Professor uh, Anima Das, to, and uh, uh, my friends here to uh, give me such a unique opportunity to uh, connect India and Japan uh, and say a few words. So, uh, how, why I say that we connect India and Japan, we are talking about manuscript logic, that uh, after my presentation, perhaps you get some idea of that. And uh, the, so, most of, I think all of you know, but I, uh, I would like to congratulate myself and I would like to congratulate NMM also. And uh, thanks to Pabeji also and other friends also here, and who, were very, um, who have Give their time and uh, energy to make this possible to have the MOU signed between Otani University and uh, NMM. So uh, that is why uh, in the beginning I would like to because now uh, we are uh, academic uh, we have the academic collaboration and perhaps most of you must not know where Otani University is. In Delhi, after this uh, gathering, somebody asked me where is it in Delhi. Uh, so. I, I think now uh, it is my kind of duty to show, show you a small glimpse of what kind of university it is and its connection with India. Then I will uh, proceed towards the uh, manuscript language because that is also related to India. Thank you so much. And I, I will try my best to come to the So, so this is uh, Otani University. And uh, Japanese Buddhist temples and academic institutions, actually uh, academic institutions are affiliated to the temples. Uh, they always, they have been playing a very significant role since the time of uh, the introduction of Buddhism in Japan in the 6th century AD. And, and uh, in promoting the Buddhist <coughs> culture and religion in Japan with a number of Indian culture and uh, Indian cultural aspects there in the culture. It is not only and uh, oops. and uh, like uh, one may find a number of uh, <coughs> deities worshipped in Japan in their regular everyday in their everyday life, like uh, Ganesha, Saraswati, Kudera, and there are many actually. And uh, we have, with my colleagues, we have been working on Kudera uh, and Saraswati since the last eight years and have worked on them. And perhaps if there is a chance in the future, I would like to share that also with all of you. And, uh, and now I come to Otani University. So this is the main building and the oldest building, sur oldest surviving building of Otani University. And it doesn't look at all like Japanese building, <laughs> the architecture as you can see. 
So it was established actually in, uh, in 1665. And uh, so Kotan University, one of such noted institutions uh, that helped in the promotion of Buddhism and Indian culture in Japan. Uh, so, and it has been doing there since the more than last 350 years. And uh, it was established as a small seminary, a small, very small seminary by the Nasidhanji denomination of Sikh Buddhism, the superior uh, Buddhist uh, sect in Japan. And subsequently, it was reorganized as a modern university in 1901. So, recently, we have celebrated uh, 128 years of our modernization. And, but now it is just after 1991, it is just like any other academic university having various disciplines, not only restricted to Buddhism, but Buddhist spirit and thoughts are there in the base of every teaching, for the, at least for the first year students, even if they are from the computer system. So, uh, this is one of the focus I got from our archives in the early 1900s, our college life. And uh, this is an alert. And this is Higashi Mangalji Temple in Kyoto. And uh, this is the main gate. So when you go through this main gate, you uh, see uh, the main uh, hall. Uh, sorry, main uh, hall. Yeah, main hall. And when you go here uh, straight inside, then you find the main shrine here. So uh, Trish Shinra is the founder of that in uh, 14th century. And uh, since then, it has been uh, disseminating education and religion and, uh, I should say, philosophy in uh, Japan. And you will be uh, happy to know that Bhutan University has a long term relationship with India, and some of the national figures also visited Bhutan uh, University. You can see uh, the same red building that I showed you in front of that, uh, is in 1924. Kavi Guru Rabindranath Tagore visited us and uh, in 1958, Dr. Rajendra Prasadji, our first president, uh, so he was visited and uh, during that time actually we will be more happy to know that uh, he was uh, an honorary PhD degree was on for him and uh, you can see Dr. Rajendra Prasadji uh, after receiving the PhD degree he is wearing the clerical robe of the judicial sector of Puryan Buddhism. And this is his PhD degree certificate. This is his PhD, this is also from our archive. And it is in the red place, it is written, it is the he received the first degree, PhD, honorary PhD degree from, from our university. And I, I personally, being an Indian, I feel very proud, very happy for that always, whenever I see that. And then during he actually he uh, uh, delivered his speech after that. I just took one line from his speech that uh, he said that Otani uh, University's um, tradition and the study of Buddhism resembled to the great appearance of Narayana University. And of course, that was a, uh, a great honor for us to hear such words from him. And then in 1916, uh, Ambassador to India, His Excellency C.P.F. Singh Ji, he also visited, and at that time he was given the second PhD, second PhD and uh, and after this is his PhD. And in 1968, His uh, Holiness Dalai Lama he also visited us, so you can see a very young Dalai Lama here. Yeah. And uh, because uh, later I will tell you, because we have a very huge collection of uh, Tibetan Peking edition manuscripts uh, that was brought from Chai, uh, sorry, uh, Tibetan Manland in 1900, in between 1914 to 18 by one of our professors from Kotan And then we uh, have also the August visit of uh, uh, many ambassadors uh, from uh, India and Russia in Tokyo, like the Excellency of Safety, and then Mani uh, Ramjipati Ji, and uh, then Vikash Varuji, who was the Consul General. So, uh, actually, there are some more I just to, to read you just to show you this condition in India. And uh, also, this is the uh, Taking a recent debate and to be the that we have. So it's a replica of that, and we do sometimes for the happiest. 
And apart from that, uh, we have a uh, class it's in our curriculum. Students get good credits for that. It's called the Religions and Culture of India. So uh, every year, the student uh, who attend 14 hours of class in the classroom and then rest 15 days they spend in India. And you can see in 2019, who's, uh, where they are invited by the Central Institute of Division Studies and uh, our director, uh, Professor Das is also there with us. And he was instrumental to organize all these things. And then our students also got some uh, sample classes of spoken Sanskrit from him and we will uh, our stay there for two days. And this September, we will be visiting again after the pandemic. So, uh, so, and, uh, the, but the uh, most glorious uh, day came to us uh, in 2022, um, March, we were uh, given uh, the uh, award for the promotion of British studies and the first award declared by ICC government of India to uh, receive by foreign policy. And uh, our vice chancellor uh, uh, is, has been uh, given that uh, by our uh, ambassador of Japan. And uh, so this is the just a glimpse of the award ceremony. And uh, Madam Ambassador is also here, and our sister is going to be here. And then during that time, they enshrined one Buddha statue in our university. So uh, it was made in India and it was all the way to Central University and just in front of the library it has been shown. So uh, this the selection of Otani University as the first recipient of this global award is needless to say, as we have already said, some of that, the result of more than 350 years of education and research based on the spirit of Buddhism while working towards an understanding of Indian thought and culture. So it's not only a Buddhism, but the, living, uh, the base it is always Indian thought and culture, and that is why we send students to come to India, know India, to, to heal with their five senses Indian culture and language as people, then only they can understand why Buddhism prospered to India. So that's the uh, main reason for that. And uh, so accumulated over the last more than three centuries since the university's inception. So this award has given us, uh, actually this with this award, it was, I should say, it was not over with that. It was a new beginning for us in last year in Japan. So with this award, it has given us a great responsibility, responsibility to carry on this legacy and further develop the tradition of the university. <coughs> And our manuscript research project, about that I will tell you later. Uh, so it is a designated research project by the Vice-Chancellor. Vice and Vice-Chancellor, after this award ceremony, he declared that, that we should have one special designated research project only on Buddhist manuscripts, because they are all living in Pali language, and other in Sanskrit and uh, Pali language. And uh, we have Tibetan, of course, uh, as I said in 1914. So uh, this, uh, uh, this, this, this research project is uh, to fulfill a part of this great responsibility of uh, receiving this award. So. And uh, Otani University is a rich collection of <coughs> paper manuscripts covering a wide range of languages, scripts, and texts, including Tibetan, Pali, Sanskrit, classical Chinese, classical Japanese, and there are some other. So, uh, and we have some old, uh, some scholars who are working on it now on their own also and descriptions they are working on stuff and excavations also, just excavations. And uh, among them, the Southeast Asian Pandit manuscripts written in Pali that draw the attention of the scholars. And it is one of the largest collections in Japan. So uh, the manuscripts are written in Pali language and uh, in different ancient uh, uh, scripts like Khmer, Burmese, Moon, and Done and single. And so, uh, just to give you an uh, overview of the thing, you can see Otani repository and manuscript, palm leaf and paper we have, and old books and others. In others, we have documents, old rough prints, wrapping cloth, wrapping cloth of the 
on the councils. We are having a separate uh, uh, sub project under this manuscript project, uh, working only on the uh, texture and the religious uh, um, religious aspects of the Latin plays. To uh, our uh, curators of textile clothes who are uh, specialists in textile, they are working on that. And uh, this, uh, so uh, here you can see this Pongi manuscript that I just told you that Kumer, uh, Mo, Gaudi, Simanis, and Lamna we have. And we have many paper manuscripts also from Nepal and uh, <coughs> manuscripts from Thailand and many uh, very old Japanese uh, scrolls, Buddhist scrolls from 7th and 8th century. And in the old books, they are um, more than. Uh, 150,000 in Chinese, classical Chinese, in classical Japanese, uh, and then from 1600 to 1912. And uh, I would like to show you just one clip from this other's category. So, uh, Japan's first printed book that was in 768 AD, and this is how it looks like. So, this is a small pagoda, and this is a garani. This Dharani is uh, scrolled uh, into a very small bowl and has been put inside uh, this. Uh, you can see the bottom. So, through that, it has been inserted inside. And uh, the Empress Shokoku, who was the first uh, woman empress of uh, Japan, and who was a Buddhist nun, and in the same time, she was reigning the country kingdom also. Very special uh, uh, figure. And uh, in 764 AD, after the suppression of the re re rebellion, uh, one million wooden stupas she ordered the commission to make. So each one containing a garden here inside it, with the belief that it would eliminate the sins, since so, they have uh, killed many people in the war and to suppress the re uh, rebellion and to help to all lots of merits and maintain the security and peace of the kingdom of the empire. <coughs> so that was the main reason for that. And this is our museum where we display uh, these uh, manuscripts uh, sometimes we have uh, <coughs> projects on that. And the research wing of Otani University is called the Sin Buddhist Comprehensive Research Institute. So this year, uh, last year, it uh, we celebrated the 40th uh, year of its uh, establishment, and uh, it has many uh, designated research projects going on. And this uh, Otani University Collection Buddhist Manuscript Research Project is just one of that. The newest one, the most recent one. So I will show you some of the paintings uh, uh, from our repository. So this is Mahabodhi Rosa, 16th to 17th century, and uh, in Sindhu. It is in Pali language, but Sindhu is in Pali. And uh, so then we have uh, Prasannapada, the commentary to Madhavika Karika, Rajinu of Nagarjuna. And uh, this is uh, the 19th century. Perhaps uh, Professor uh, Das can give us some new dates. We are not sure. So, uh, they are all from Nepal. We imported from Nepal. And uh, the Lalita Vista also we have. It is 18th to 20th century. So, and as I told you, uh, the uh, ambassador of India was carrying this gift of this painting, uh, this replica of this uh, taking reason, Tibetan manuscript. So then we have both, yeah, and uh, many extra canonical texts also. And then uh, you can see this is uh, Yoga Chara Bhumi Shastra, and um, 739 in classical Chinese. So uh, actually, we whoever uh, studies uh, Buddhism in Japan, we must learn classical Chinese because uh, the Sanskrit manuscripts were were uh, there. They're damaged. There are many regions they say intentionally some are intentionally some are by particular fire 
ending. So they are not there. So why we why we are having this all these manuscripts and we collected this manuscripts Tibetan and classical Chinese is there to reconstruct the Sanskrit, the, the lost parts of the Sanskrit, so that we can at least come closer to the original text. That's the reason behind it. Languages. Yeah. Languages. Classical Chinese. And uh, this is the catalog that we should have got. Uh, I have already given a copy uh, to a uh, So this catalog uh, was made in 1995. Only the palm leaf manuscript around uh, 900 entries roughly left here. And uh, only the palm leaf manuscripts of uh, Pali we have here. And in all the four uh, scripts. So I have taken some clips. Uh, if, if you are interested, please see the colored photos from in the catalog. We have some in some of them. And this palm leaf manuscript in Kumer Street we have. This is Dharma Sangani in Kumer Street. And then uh, in Burmese Street, it is Murkapak, one of the Jataka stories in Burmese Street. And uh, this is in Moon Street. Uh, this is uh, Pali Muttaka Binayagi Nishaya Sangaha Nishaya. It is a Nishaya, it's the commentary uh, reached with the hybrid of the local languages. And this is uh, palm leaf manuscripts in Lanka State uh, of Dhatha Vansa, that is known as Dhatha Vansa, the Dhatha Vansa, there is the narratives of that. And it has a colloquium of 1750. And when I was in Thailand, uh, I talked to some of the scholars, they said that this much old Tathavamsa, they don't have to do central Thai. So, uh, because it was transmitted to them from Sri Lanka, and Sri Lanka, uh, they, they don't have that old one. So now they have offered some projects to do together, and after this direction, we will start working on that. Uh, a comparative study of the Tathavamsa, of different Buddhist cultures. And uh, so uh, we have actually, we group that into two groups. Uh, the first group has 64 bundles. 64 bundles doesn't mean the 64 texts. 64 bundles actually it will uh, count around the uh, little uh, list, 780 or 780 something is there. So text, text entries are there. That I will show you later. So perhaps I will show you. So you see, there are many uh, here. Here you can see. Yeah. So it is called phuk. Phuk and this big bundle is called mat. So in one mat, they have many texts actually. Sometimes the one part of the one, uh, like Dighanika, uh, Ola uh, Dighanika, sometimes you may find, or sometimes if the text is small, then they keep two or three uh, from the Tributaka together. So it depends actually. And they don't tie that to uh, this mark. Mark is not tied, but the foots, the small, small bundles inside, you can see with the threads, and they are tied and uh, they keep, keep it separate. So, uh, in, we have most of them in Khmer Street and 59 bundles, and Burmese Street 4 bundles, 4 mark early, and uh, then Moon Street we have only one bundle. And the first group of manuscripts uh, uh, that is uh, all in uh, in Pali language, but the scripts are different. And I'm not going to use the desert point, we don't know. So, please uh, uh, bear with me. And uh, the first group of manuscripts, you can uh, see it is quite long, just very typical of the Southeast Asian manuscripts uh, of Thailand. And uh, 53 to 60 centimeter and 5.1 to 5.5 centimeter. And the edges are painted in gold or in vermilion and gold. And uh, there are 11 manuscripts that are beautifully painted uh, uh, copper gilds, golden plants. Most of them have a black, blacker background and gold on that. So I'll just show you one. So these edges are painted in edges are painted in gold, and you can see there is a uh, pattern here. 
So this is a very typical of Southeast Asian maps in Thailand. This pack, from this pattern, you can decipher the date of the uh, manuscript. It, be, it belongs to the Ayutthaya area. So, uh, and another thing is that it makes your work easier to know whether any hook from this mark has been displaced or damaged. Because then the pattern is broken. So, and it looks beautiful anyway. So, and these are the 11 uh, wooden planks we have uh, that uh, they, they are used to place uh, uh, so like uh, 20 to 30, so 20 to 15 hooks together. They, just, they are placed with the wooden planks. And uh, there are no uh, stream holes here because they are not really tied, they are just placed and then tied with the wrapping rope. That is why we are working on the wrapping clothes also as well. And uh, the second group of manuscripts, they are not in good condition. The first group is in very good condition and they are from the royal collection of Thailand. And the second group uh, from the northern Thailand, they are in the Lama script. Most of them are in Lama script. And uh, you can see the size is also very small compared to the previous uh, first group. And the oldest one, as I showed you, is from 75. And the majority of them are Java stories in Hong And uh, so, uh, to summarize, I can say that uh, the opening of Pali manuscripts of Odani collection, uh, we have uh, commentary, sub commentary, and, and sub sub commentaries, Tika and Amitika, Tagata Tika and Amitika, and Abhidharma. Uh, Most of them are Abhidharma. And uh, many Jataka stories we have, and one is Pannasa Jataka, the 50 Jataka, that is extra canonical Jataka aircraft in Southeast Asia. And uh, that part of the river was written there. And many extra canonical texts we have that they were written in Sri Lanka and Southeast Asian countries, but not in India. The language is Pali. So uh, this Kumer script is called Kum in Thai. And uh, they use the Northern Thailand is Lamna state, and that is uh, uh, called Tham. It is from Dham. And they call Tham. And uh, every crook is of 24 leaves. And uh, sometimes you have 23 or 32, as we have also in our uh, collection. Uh, but uh, why? Because to, when it is not complete with 13, 24 leaves, then just add some more or less one, make less one to contact. And the agination they use, uh, they use the consonants instead of the numerals. So, uh, and uh, so this using this uh, uh, this name, using giving Lagna is called Tham, Lagna is called Dhamma, Dhamma script, they call it Dhamma script. So uh, why uh, it is, you see, uh, this kind of things, we can, we can see the influence of Buddhism on the Brahmi inscriptions also. Perhaps we don't know if Buddhism was not there, perhaps Ashoka would not have uh, created Brahmi script, if you remember. And then we know that in Sri Lanka, how Buddhism has a great influence on their language and script both. So these kind of things are very much fascinating. So it is not only reading the scripts, but so many other factors are there that uh, we work on uh, while working on the manuscripts. And uh, so they use ka ka ki ki ku ku ke ka ko ko ka ka so it is 12, 12 into 2, 24. And then ka ka ki ki it goes on like that. <coughs> So, what fascinated me, I read <coughs> some books and I was from South Indian manuscripts and I was reading that in Grantha manuscripts, the paginations are also like that, but they are they, they, uh, la, la, also there. And uh, then uh, in Malayalam uh, uh, manuscripts, pagination, they have na as one and na as two, and like that, they have their own system. So, uh, what occurred to me is that and this suggests that perhaps this suggests that this tradition might have been introduced from South India to Sri Lanka as, and from Sri Lanka to Thailand with Buddhism or directly from South India to uh, directly from South India to Sri Lanka and Thailand both in two ways. It could be possible in both ways. 
So uh, how about we need to work more on it and uh, to find out very concrete evidence for that. And uh, uh, these days I'm trying to study some more of uh, the, the pagination of some other parts of uh, manuscripts from other parts of India. <coughs> And uh, therefore, this research project is not limited, it does not limit its scope of study to the written words, but also attaches importance to the manuscript culture that lies in the base of the manuscript. The aim is to carry out international and interdisciplinary research and beliefs, a research of the script, language, cultures, and beliefs uh, of South and Southeast Asia. And where we know that it is needless to say that Indian culture has a big influence and contribution to that. So, uh, so in short, it is not only based on theological studies, but also on wider aspects of manuscript studies. And by comparing and examining Buddhist culture concerning manuscripts in India, Sri Lanka, Thailand, Myanmar, and other southern, like Laos, also Southeast Asian countries, where manuscript study traditions still exist. That is very important actually. Still exist and occupy an important place in their day to day life. So, uh, the receptivity of Buddhism in various cultures may be made clear. That for that, we are working, uh, we are having a wider vision of our manuscript work in my program. And uh, some of my friends in LMM they were asking about the preservation. So, I just had two, three photos I would like to show that. That is uh, preservation they have in the traditional way and the modern technique book. In traditional way, they use the upon. Upon is kind of Japanese turmeric. It means like raw turmeric actually. And uh, upon dyed yellow cloth they use and traditional paper they use. What uh, I have seen in the conservation center called Japanese tissue they are calling. So we call the washi actually. And we use their colonial boxes and a traditional bookcase also we use that I will show you. And the modern technique is just the temperature and humidity controlling and protecting from earthquake was the biggest problem for us and fire also. And uh, deoxidizing and other things as everywhere it is. So uh, the, it is in the underground and then you can see uh, we work in the underground and it is like a bank locker. So with the earthquake and fire also it is safe. So that is, that is how it is kept. This is Ukon dyed the yellow uh, yellow cloth, and then they tie it like this and in the following uh, box because it is porous and there's an the island country with lots of humidity, so it helps us to breathe. It helps it to breathe. And uh, this is uh, for the paper books. So this is a book, right side, and the left side is the cover. So this cover is uh, working like uh, substituting the colonial box, you can say, and the uh, Turmeric diet, you can say it is called chitsu. Chitsu, and uh, you can see it is threefold, and you can put the, <coughs> in the, you put the uh, paper or manuscript, and then you just wrap it up and it looks like this. So it is then protected. And this is made of washi as you, as you are using in for the uh, conservation. And some of the chitsu they are very beautiful with uh, woven silk. And uh, to, that belongs to the nobles and the royal personalities. So, uh, and uh, while ideology and ideology manuscript research is mainly concerned with creating the diplomatic edition, critical edition, transmission work, our research project aims to undertake comprehensive research on various aspects of ideology, bibliology, and manuscriptology using Buddhist manuscripts in the university's collection and other manuscripts from a comparative view. So uh, this is how uh, I just draw the diagram to know. And, uh, you see, Buddhist manuscripts have so many factors too, and in the accessories, sometimes we have many other things, the uh, sky and the, the uh, belt of the uh, because of the belt of the um, monks and uh, so many other things are there so that to give that tell a lot about the manuscript itself uh, from the first class and then what another important thing we are taking is that the religious view and uh, this manuscript so all these things they are forming uh, I have to 
of the manuscript culture. And this manuscript culture, on the base of this manuscript culture, you find people's religious faith. If people's religious faith had not been there, then we would not have got any manuscript until now, handed down since generations. And just to uh, tell you one thing that in uh, Sadharma Kundalika Sutra, uh, around the first, second century, they are telling the date for so, uh, the Mahayana text. It has a, uh, it says elaborately about the preservation and conservation of manuscripts. And if you worship manuscript, then what kind of merits you get by that? It is like worshiping thousands of Buddhas. So this kind of religious sentiments of the people, it had, it must have created a big awareness among the uh, people those days. No, we must keep them carefully. That is why we are getting a lot of manuscripts in the Gandhara area and we'll be telling you uh, from the uh, excavation in the students, you know. So, this religious, ignoring this religious sentiments of the people, manuscript work is not enough as <coughs> what uh, we think and we are giving a very primary uh, importance to that while working on. Otherwise, it is just an accumulation of letters, nothing else without the religious sentiment. So, I just speak uh, only one thing, then I will, I will speak the rest of that. <coughs> we are having a joint research group with Hyderabad University, uh, the Classical Ideology Department. I was there as uh, a guest producer for the for one year in 2017, and that's why we developed manuscriptology and digital humanities. And what we are doing there, <coughs> trying to connect the ancient with the modern. How we can do better the manuscript studies with the modern technology, both editing, digitalization, all the aspects there. And we uh, have uh, online uh, lecture series, workshops. So I will send from onwards uh, the links to uh, Professor Adinwan Das also so that he can advertise it if you are interested. It is completely free of cost. Please do join. Yes. Yeah. And so what we are trying to in this way, we are trying to create a network between things and people. Things means the manuscript and people who can work on them. Having, they don't have the manuscript or manuscript culture, but the Western scholars, they are helping us with the other aspects of Indology and Uttarvaj. And so this one is, it is not only Buddhist manuscripts, in Japan we have the uh, Mahabharata in Korea and uh, that I am working since a long time, it's a Vanaparva on the manuscripts discovered from the temple and uh, mm -hmm. Professor, they are telling it is uh, end, uh, around the end of last half of the 17th century, but somehow I will be so, anyway, so date is not important because okay. the manuscript itself is important. <laughs> and uh, I, in this place, I would like to thank uh, Professor Samu from uh, Dana Samu from JNU, uh, offering the Odia chair to publish that uh, in this year. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so this is, uh, this is the manuscript. And, uh, and uh, I, I'm not going to details because we are left in time and I will give you the details uh, to Professor Das if, if you are interested. Tokyo University is the national university in Japan. They have just last year have opened 57 manuscripts uh, with uh, more than 6,000 folios digitized and all are open online. And they are having Amaropus and other things also. This is another manuscript, uh, uh, sorry, another temple. They have the Buddha's relics. Actually, I forgot to tell you this manuscript, how did they reach us? It has a big uh, uh, contribution of Indian government. In 1886-87, when the Chitrava relics was uh, excavated, that time India gave a small part of relics to Shima, Siam, Thailand. And Siam again gave us to Japan and our university priest, priest come professors. We have most of them are priest come professors. They went to receive that and that time, King of Siam donated all these royal manuscripts to us and it arrived to us. So actually the credit goes to India and then. So uh, it arrived to us. The manuscripts are in the library, uh, sorry, in our university since 1900. <coughs> and the relics were are enshrined in this temple. It is in now. In the so what I mean to say that this kind of many, many we are having 
uh, many scattered manuscripts in temples and uh, organizations and uh, you know, personal collections. Uh, one person is having Chandi Saptasati and Govada Nirupana, Govada Prayashtita Nirupana Sutta. It is in Odia, but Sanskrit, Odia script, Sanskrit form. So that kind of things are like in a scattered, in a scattered way. What I would like to propose here and suggest here to, because now we have the MOU, directors, so if you time to miss a little possible, we can have a, uh, make a catalog on the database of infinite manuscripts in the time, and those scattered things we can keep together so that we have the overall thing of the manuscripts manuscript there. And uh, with uh, this, actually, uh, I would like to uh, conclude. And this MOU is not be not the beginning, but a continuation of the friendly relationship that was started with Honorable Dr. Ravindra Prasadji. And uh, I believe it will serve as the bridge to connect India and Japan on an intellectual platform. Thank you. Dear Dr. Shubha Ramitas, I for the distinguished uh, scholars, experts, and good day experts here, director of FNM, and all of you. It's a great pleasure to meet her and uh, listen to her. And it's so fascinating for me that uh, when we talk about Hingashi Hawanji and the Dani University, the connection between as we said, that priest professors. So this is actually the combination of Yanodaya and Dhanodaya. So with Buddhism, you will see this aspect. I'm I'm going to cut short everything that I want to say because I have to go for another urgent meeting. So I'll be very, very brief, but just bring out a few points that I can't stop myself. <laughs> so it's a, it's a, it's an amazing factor that Gyanodaya and Dhanodaya and even Rajyodaya should be added. As you will see in the flag of Mongolia, that there are two major pillars. One represents state and the other represents dharma. And dharma is protected, promoted by monks and spies. So, it's a great uh, pleasure to have you and to listen to you because Otani University, because the Otani expedition, they had a very good collection from Central Asia. So maybe it's not there in the law university, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, they are scattered because it was the Otani the expedition that had brought a rich collection from Central Asia and uh, that also has to be I think taken care of and uh, when she was talking about the Hindu ladies, uh, I just wanted to share with you that my PhD degree is on Junita, on the 12 basic degrees. Uh, Indra so they are still worshipped in thousands of Shingon monasteries, temples today. So and uh, the and the, when we talk of uh, India's uh, cultural relations, and we talk about Shingon sect, Shingon is the closest sect because they preserve so many Vedic traditions like performing of Homo, etc. So I'm not going to get into the details. So when you uh, they talked about Kubera Vaishnava. Right? And Kubera are slightly confused yeah. in Japan. And I have a research paper on Vaishravana long, long ago. I know that I will send it to you. And Monk Shimran, yes, she, she, she was talking about the monks. You see, the, one of the monks, Shimran, like this. There are so many monks in Japan who are traveling long distances, talking to people, preaching the Dharma, and their life was so dedicated to Dharma. And this is why Dharma could be preserved. Not only in Japan, but all over. When you look at the a temple, uh, you see in Japan, China, Korea, a, a building for a temple and building for a government office or a palace, they have the same architectural design because initially it began, the tradition began in China that uh, the same uh, radical was used for a palace and for a temple because it was for them the same. So some even palaces were converted into temples. So I'm not going to do that. Okay. So, uh, 
Horyuji. Yeah, I just wanted to share one incident with you that in Horyuji, uh, uh, the name Horyuji means Dharma Vardhana Mahavihara. That is the oldest existing temple in Japan. And the murals <coughs> in its golden hall were burned. I'm not going into the details how it went. But when the murals were burned, the Japanese thronged to Horyuji crying bitterly and the minister of culture had to resign because it is the responsibility of our ministers to protect us. So this is the this is the this is the day how Japan has preserved. Presentation of uh, catalog uh, youth. I have also published the catalog of Mongolian Tattoo last yeah, year. I have, and I have, uh, you have received the book? Yes, yes, okay. okay. That's so I wanted to give you. <coughs> for many years, maybe for a few decades in the academia, it was uh, considered the Japanese manuscript of Gupta period of Krishna Paramita Hide and Ushesh uh, Vidyadhanti. The two manuscripts in the in Horiji monastery that were taken to Japan for promulgation <coughs> of the constitution of Japan. You can never have this kind of an example that for promulgation of any constitution, a Sanskrit mantra is chanted. Sanskrit ke mantra se Bharat mein karke bhi kai ke nahi ho kai ke. So, aise aise bhoat sari udharan hai, jinke vishay mein hum log bhoat vishtar se chakya karna chahenge. And there are a few points, Central Asian collection as you told, they are all scattered, but Kotani expedition was brought a very good collection and the Sanskrit manuscripts there, our Central Asian collection is there in our National Museum also. But unfortunately, the work that the scholars abroad are doing is not really that, unfortunately, in our country. So I just wanted to know the 768 first printed matter. Uh, what is that uh, that that is printed? Is it a dharani? They are all dharani. Yeah, one million script. Oh, that I know. Because you see, Jo, उन्होंने आपको बताया one million stupa. What does it mean? क्योंकि जब हमें पुण्य प्राप्त करना है and I want to एक बार आप एक का एक सौ आठ बार माला फेंकते हैं या एक हजार बार एक हजार आठ बार फेंकते हैं ऐसे तो लक्ष्य पूजा होती थी ये तो है लक्ष्य पूजा मतलब कि एक लाख वो हम लोग आप जम्मू में जाएंगे मंदिर में तो वहाँ देखेंगे एक लाख शिवलिंग है तो इस टाइम इट इज़ नॉट पॉसिबल टू मेक लाइक वो मिलियन पिगोडास वर टू बी मेड बट इट इज़ नॉट पॉसिबल सो व्हाट दे वर डूइंग इज़ दैट मेक वन एंड इंसर्ट द धारणी इंसाइड एंड दैट इज़ द बिगिनिंग ऑफ़ गुड ब्लॉक प्रिंटिंग फ्रॉम हियर इट स्टार्टेड कि उसका जो बनाते थे जैसे वो हमारे यहाँ टप्पा लगाते हैं ना ऐसे करके एक लाख तो अगर आपको अगर किसी if you are going to do some puja ki bodhis bodhis sattu ki for example अब लोग भी देख सकते हैं कि आपको puja करनी है you want to do it one million times or one lakh times hundred thousand times so what they used to do is टप्पा लगा देते हैं उसका और उसको एक बड़ी मूर्ति बना के उसको नीचे से उसमें डाल देते हैं so there are a number of examples such examples that I used to talk when I was teaching history of Japanese art at the National Museum. My most of the thesis was also on Shikansa. So she talked about, I, I just wanted to clarify a few things because I know uh, what Indians, as Indians, we know and we need to know. So gold and lacquer, it's all so common because in Buddhism or in Hinduism, wherever, wherever there is dharma, then we want to do our best. अगर इफ यू आर चैंटिंग यू ट्राइ टू बी बैक टू प्रेस बॉयस इफ यू आर डांसिंग इफ यू आर मेकिंग अ मैनस्क्रिप्ट राइटिंग अ मैनस्क्रिप्ट तो देर आर मैनस्क्रिप्ट्स रिटर्न विथ सप्त रत्न जो सात प्रकार के रत्नों का सेवन जेम्स इंक बना देते कभी गोल्ड की बना देते कभी सिल्वर की बना देते एंड दे यूज लेयर्स फॉर एग्जाम्पल वन लेयर ऑफ सिल्क देन अप्लाई लेटर देन अनदर लेयर ऑफ सिल्क देन अप्लाई लेटर then make it thick and then they used to write with gold, silver or gem. So it's amazing. Wrapping with cloth is important because it protects manuscripts. 
and colors are also important as somebody was telling me about the color of a cloth that is used for wrapping the manuscript that is also important. And then you talked about turmeric. Turmeric protects the medicines. In our kitchens, normally we use turmeric. Uh, if there are ants, you put some turmeric. Anything that you want to protect, you use turmeric. So it's a commonly rice paper. I was wondering, do you have any manuscripts of rice paper and cotton paper? Yes, uh, cotton paper, I, I don't know, but rice, rice you paper. You see, rice paper, rice paper. I don't know if you have any study. No, I don't know. So actually, I wanted to make it clear there is a lot of controversy about production of paper that who was the first to produce paper or about India there is a there is a narrative that India got a paper only when the Arabs came and some people say it is China that was the first but we uh, I have written a small article on it that who was the first to, to produce paper but another narrative another point that I want to bring to your uh, the NMM department especially that there are many kinds of paper one is cotton paper हम लोग रूई से कपास से बनाते हैं उसके बाद जो है जब चाइना में आप रेडिकल्स देखते हैं उसके सो दे आर डिफरेंट आपका जो पेपर बनता है कॉटन पेपर दैट इज डिफरेंट इज रिटर्न एंड जो आपका प्लांट से बनता है दैट इज डिफरेंट एंड देन राइस पेपर एंड सिल्क पेपर सिल्क वाज आल्सो यूज्ड एंड देन देयर इज जो अरेबियन स्टाइल ऑफ पेपर है अभी रिसेंटली स्ट्रक टू माय माइंड that when we were children and we used to bind our school books so last में वो उसके ऊपर cover चढ़ाते थे गद्दे के ऊपर so that was called अबरी paper so I was just thinking that the paper what we were called अबरी paper somebody has written that it was glazed paper जो Arabic paper है that is the glazed kind of a paper so that is different kind of a paper from the Indian paper, from the Chinese paper, from the Tibetan style of paper. So, Arbi or Abri, I'm not sure, but this came to my mind, so I thought I should share with you. And IOP, Indian Institute of Sopa Gatai Kalina, they have a very good collection and Lotus Sutra, they have the best, I think the complete Lotus Sutra that is also discovered from Central Asia. So, working on Central Asian collections is also really, very challenging. I have been, I have seen some collections, for example, in Berlin. How small pieces, I will just send you some, I have a, um, uh, this one of the Japanese professor, unfortunately, passed away. Very good friend and very good scholar of Sanskrit. How he works, Seishika Rishima, Seishika Rishima, how we had gathered stick with small pieces of the same page of a manuscript. One was from uh, St. Petersburg, another was from uh, the British uh, Library, and another was different collections, say he collected and he could identify and bring them to them. So this is the way the Japanese are working. We really are really, really respect them so much for the dedication and the hard work, intense work that they are doing. And I will send you some photographs of the uh, of the manuscript that they discovered from a dry river bed. Suddenly the river was very important. So suddenly there was a uh, river bed that was being excavated for construction. Or suddenly they discovered manuscripts there. What? Why they were manuscripts were there? Because जैसे हम लोग पूजा करने जाते हैं भगवान से कहते हैं कि भगवान हमें ये दो हम ये दो हम ये करेंगे पूजा करते हैं कुछ चाहते हैं तो जापान में there is a tradition कि वो जाके जो आपने आपने इच्छा है उसके लिए you have a manuscript and offer to the temple. Now what the temple will do? इतने इतने सारे उनके पास इकट्ठा हो जाते हैं they used to immerse in them. Or the ink still has not faded. Ink is so special in Japan. Sumi ekeleji has kertyan. That is amazing. And even after remaining in water, after being immersed into river, you can read them. It's amazing. 
So there is a lot and, uh, about, but uh, uh, I would uh, like to say that uh, uh, Dr. Shoba, because you are in Japan, and uh, uh, because of all my research that I have been, I have been doing for years and years. So what I found is that it is an under-researched area that what kind of direct relations were there with me. Because I can see when I study history of art of Japan, I can see direct influences from South India to Japan. That is not research. For example, the Hiragana Katakana systems. Akasatana. And finally, there is a mesolite sound only. And that is only in town. So how, and for example, they call Bodhidharma is called Daruma, so it's very South Indian kind of a pronunciation. There are many such instances. So there's a lot that has to be researched from the Indian side also. There is not much that is that we are doing. So hope uh, we, uh, I wish the best for preparing a catalog uh, that should soon come. Uh, it should not be delayed because it's a long, long awaiting project and Indians should come to this. And they can. They have the capacity of doing it. So I hope with these words, because of uh, rushing for another meeting, I'm sorry, but uh, Japan is in my heart and soul, <laughs> and always uh, we shall be working on this more, um, and uh, there is a lot that we can do together. And, uh, all the best for you, and uh, please convey my regards to the university, my greetings, and uh, best wishes to the NMM and also uh, to the Thank Thani you. University, being a lifelong disciple of Rakesh Chandraji yeah. uh, and working on his father, how he was the first actually who invited scholars, yeah. not scholars, students yeah. from Japan, Chikyo uh, Yamamoto, he was in Kurosan. And uh, we have stayed together with him and he came here and uh, we had a very good relationship with Professor Chikil Yamamoto. He was the first who was invited by the program that was not long. Now. So, and when the institute was started, the Prohibition Jazz Institute, International Economics and Culture, the first donation was given by a Japanese scholar. Yeah. It was for 51 rupees. <laughs> <laughs> so, with this, the institute was started, and unfortunately, everything he lost um, after uh, the partition, uh, so many things, so many things got lost, unfortunately, but still, whatever we have, it's a great treasure. And, uh, with these words, I'm thankful to you for inviting me and uh, meeting you, especially. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. What a great congregation. <coughs> See, the <coughs> scholars, <coughs> Professor <coughs> Shravananda. So, interrupt you. Mm -hmm. Just uh, one minute, uh, yeah, I would like to say uh, that please convey my regards to and uh, to Dr. Lokesh yeah, and uh, tell him perhaps he has forward, I don't know. Uh, we are translating uh, uh, into Japanese, me and one of my colleagues, uh, this uh, Achari Raghuvira's expedition. Okay. 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 Yeah, yeah. And uh, two times already published, and one time is Oh, great. Yeah. That is the only, that is the first book on the Yeah. yeah. And you know, when Dr. Raghuvira was in the Japanese. And recently, he is asking us many times to. Uh, translate that in China and yeah. lecture on that, but I'm very scared because I'm having still having my Indian passport. I'm very scared because of the contents, you know. And uh, uh, they now they they have this uh, section. You know. Thank you very much. As we have of national mission for manuscript. What is plenty three to four, you know, is so informative, eye opener, and combination of three Buddhist scholars, our director, Dr. Adibana, speaker, and the chairperson. Three of them are equally scholar, and I didn't see Professor Dr. Ashim Bhavi, who was the pioneer of the Indian culture promotion and and everybody who has participated, who have participated here, thank you very much. Mission is happy to have uh, this type of uh, lecture here and such a big scholars. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.